Of us, we want to turn in our scriptures to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're going to do a little bit of Old Testament study here this morning. Probably one of the more difficult books of the Bible to understand, but hopefully by the uh, Spirit of God we'll be able to uh, make sense out of what appears to make no sense. But it does. And once I think we're finished, we'll be able to rejoice in the things of the Lord together. So our reading, uh, Psalm Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, it will begin at verse 13 of chapter 9, and we'll conclude this morning with chapter 10 and verse 4. So if you turn there, as Brother Charlie will come forward now and, and read these words to us. Good morning. Good morning. Ecclesiastes 9.13 to chapter 10.4. 9.13 to 10.4. This wisdom... Have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. There was a little city, and a few men within it, and there came a great king against it, and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that rules among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yeah, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. Amen. Well, I think... Uh to begin this passage and understand it correctly, it's best for us to go before the throne of grace and asking God <clears throat> that he would be able to uh, give us a mind to receive these inspired words given to us by King Solomon in his day. Father, we do approach you here this morning. The pinnacle of worship, the highlight of the hour, is that when the thus saith the Lord falls into the ears of us as listeners in this auditorium from the pulpit to the pew. We pray, Father, that you would give us that kind of hearing and that it would enter into the deep, into the recesses of our heart, revealing to us uh, the sin that needs to be exposed and then the words of admonition, the means of forgiveness and the comfort of the Holy Spirit being pardoned by the, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, guide us in our thoughts here today to be focused and give undivided attention to you as you've blessed with, with ears to hear, and words, and speech, and preaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We would all have to agree that the highlight of the last couple of weeks have been the Kavanaugh hearings on the nomination of President Trump and Brent Kavanaugh for the position on the uh, Supreme Court as a judge. And it goes without saying that there's been much controversy over uh, the whole matter of this appointment, all the the, uh, the questioning and the hearings and the process. And then there is that matter which is not on typical for the day. Something is uh, dredged up from the past to uh, be laid out before uh, not only congressional listeners but also to that of the entire world. And so we are uh, then left with uh, many big decisions. and. We have tried to endeavor to reach conclusions. We are left with a lot of questions, such as, what is any of this true? Did it really take place? These accusations of what happened some 20 years ago, are they real? What do we do with the evidence of the very book that the man wrote? We take and we hear all that, and then we reach a conclusion, but then we see where this individual is today. Uh, a man of character, a man of intelligence, a man that is a, uh, a um, he interprets this, the, the uh, Constitution as a literalist, and he, he makes judgment on what the Constitution's original intent was. And so these are the things that we need in that, that political office, but we're faced with the dilemma of what has transpired in the past. 
Well, it's not my mission this morning, and I don't think it should be any of ours right now to try and reach a conclusion on any of these matters. But rather take into consideration that uh, whatever did take place in the past, something brought the issue up. And we have to look at this from a biblical worldview and learn lessons from these things. You see, we'll never really know the truth, never from the media, and perhaps we would learn it from the individual if we had the opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Only time in history has these things recorded, and the Lord knows for sure. And so we're left with to look at this and with wisdom from God and, uh, and uh, reviews and uh, questioning and hearings that take place, all the evidence brought forth. We leave that to our political leaders at Washington. And we pray that God would be able to have his mercy and, and work things out according to his will. But what do we learn from these kind of situations? It's not the first time it's ever happened. It's not the first time where individuals of, of prestige and honor and character is, and in this time and these days uh, have, come, have left something in their past. And it, it lies there as skeletons in a closet. And suddenly the door is open and the moth fly out and there sits the skeletons. Do we gain any insight from these things that would help us today? And I believe it does. This passage in Ecclesiastes speaks to the matter of, of politics. It speaks to the matter of government. It speaks to the issue of those things that have happened in the past that nobody thought would ever make any difference in the world. And I think the greatest lesson that we can learn from this, especially for the younger generation, and any of us that, that have any idea or contemplating some kind of future, I have to remember that the, as, as the uh, inscription there is on, this, on the slide, indiscretion has its consequences. Regardless of what it is, whether it's provable or not, an act of indiscretion has consequences on the, on, the, on the strength of wisdom. And so the title of the sermon is The Strength and the Vulnerability of Wisdom. And then the subtitle being for this morning, Indiscretion Has Its Consequences. And that's what you are witnessing. And this, but you'll probably begin to see more of this as we go along. But since we are really not involved in those kind of situations, we look to the scriptures and we have to take into consideration we also live lives uh, that we have no idea what God's plans are for us as individuals in the future. And because of that, is there a role model? Is there a path? Is there a way of life that we should have so that should God call us and put us in a position whereby we will have public recognition that we would be there with honor. There would be no indiscretion. And how do we live today in order to make that happen? And by the way, it doesn't have to be in Washington that you're going to go. I know of people that have applied from, for some high-profile jobs, FBI agents, or perhaps even the CIA, positions that require an absolutely pure background check. You can have no uh, indiscretion, no violations, no breaking the law, not even speeding tickets to get some of these jobs. An individual can be well-trained, highly educated, be able and have a passion and a desire for that particular job, and yet something of their past as a young teenager or as maybe in their early 20s when they weren't thinking straight, and all of a sudden that which appeared to be dead and dormant comes to light, no job over a simple act of carelessness, folly, is the way that our text gives it to us this morning. So the, our, what our objective this morning is to be able to understand, for example, in chapter 10 and verse 1, dead flies cause the ointment of the apocryphary to send forth a stinking savor, and so does a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Little things matter. Little things matter today. And the little things matter in terms of consequences for unknown years to follow. So would anybody have ever thought that acts of fun at a university while you're in college would have made any difference 20 years later? Probably not. And that's the point of the lesson today. So there's much to learn. Basically this, folly can ruin the strength of wisdom. Even though Solomon is using politics as the example, and we'll, we'll unfold that as we go along, his main theme is the fact that it's the use of wisdom 
in politics, the use of wisdom in daily life, the use of wisdom in our speech is going to maintain the strength of wisdom itself. And so it is, it's a, the whole subject in chapter 9 and in chapter 10, all of chapter 10, is about the use of wisdom in life and the fact that it is vulnerable to folly. So you'll see this comparison as we go along. It's wisdom versus folly. The two are diametrically opposed to each other. That is the theme. The political menu and, and that uh, milieu is the example that he cites. And so from this passage and between now and two Sundays later, it'll be a three-part sermon. Um, it, we're going to focus on uh, three major points. Number one is going to be that a little folly can ruin the strength of wisdom. That's where our primary emphasis will be today. A little folly can ruin the strength of wisdom. The second part, and that's found, by the way, in verses uh, from chapter 9, verse 13, up through 10 and verse 4. When, as we go uh, move on this evening, we'll look at the second point, the use of wisdom in our daily walk. And you'll find that in, from verses 5 down through um, verse 12, 5 to 12. And then the third part is going to be the use of wisdom in our daily talk. And that would be from verse 12 on through to the end of the chapter, verse 20. So if you have folly that can ruin the strength of wisdom, the use of wisdom in our daily walk, and the use of wisdom in our daily talk. Are there going to be the three, the three main divisions of the, of the chapters as we go through it? So let's, let's begin first with this here this morning. A little folly can ruin the strength of wisdom. How does that happen? Well, he gives to us a political setting. Begin in verse 13, he says, This wisdom I have seen under the sun. And it seemed great unto me that there was this little city and a few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. And there was found in it a poor wise man. And by his wisdom he delivered the city. And no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised. And his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that is among the fools. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. So we take these words into consideration. You understand what we have is a little city, part of a country. And in that little city are people. And there's a government. And now we have another king that's going to come in from the outside, and he's going to besiege that city. simply means he's going to surround it with, uh, with soldiers, and he's going to starve the people out. That is the idea of besieging a city. In the process of doing that, he brings in war machinery. And it says there, and he, and he built great bulwarks against it. Now within this city, so we, now we have a, 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 a big king, a big army, and we have a little city, and a little army, and and a, a king that's probably just wringing his hands, not knowing what to do. Meanwhile, in between, in the alleys of the street, there's a poor wise man. And this man, this, this poor man, and the emphasis is on the fact that he is an insignificant individual that probably nobody really cared about or would ever listen to. In fact, we read that later on. Nobody really paid attention to anything that this guy had to say. Why? He was a beggar. He's just there. But this poor man in this city somehow is able to influence the politicians. He's able to influence the government leaders, influence the army, the guard that is there. And in the end, the victory becomes of that of the small city as a result of a little guy on the street corner with no name and much wisdom. And so the, the point of that is to say that there is great strength. When you look at verse 13, it says, This wisdom I've seen in the sun, and it seemed great unto me. And as he moves down to verse 16, the conclusion of the story, he says, Then I said, I, wisdom is better than strength. So here he's, he's bringing a conclusion to the episode, the, the story of what has taken place in this city. And his emphasis is that wisdom has much strength. And its much strength comes from the little guy, the no man, the no name, the individual. And that's just simply a, a way of emphasizing the fact 
that it may not seem like much, words may not seem like much, his ideas may not have ever hit the books, but he rescued the city. How did the man rescue the city? Well, as we read about this, this little city and a few men, and there was a poor, wise man, and by his wisdom. The strength of wisdom isn't found in the individual itself, it's found in, by virtue of itself. Wisdom's strength comes from the fact that it is that which is able to give ideas and directions and thought, ask the right questions, and do the right thing, and get the big picture, and do something about it. Now we'll find later on that the wisdom that we're talking about is not a secular wisdom. It doesn't come from a lot of textbooks or from a university or a college background, but it comes from the scriptures and from coming to know Jesus Christ. But for our story right now, there is no mention of God in the text. The strength of the story is found in the, the, the uh, uh, strength of wisdom itself. And he's making it and comparing it then to that of folly. You'll notice the use of things that are little. First conclusion is this, the strength of wisdom. How do we know that? Because he says in verse 16 that wisdom is better than strength. The words of the wise are heard in quiet in verse 17. And then wisdom is better than weapons of war in verse 18. He makes those three statements to make his point that there is much power and might in wisdom itself. Now to get at some idea just a little bit of what this poor little guy you know on the street may have been uh, just if you do reflect back to the book of Esther and we have Queen uh, Esther and and there's a situation that arises inside of politics inside of of the the uh, governance of that city and who's outside the gate somebody really not known a Jew and he's the uncle of the queen. And when this Jew just sitting by the king's gate is listening and he eavesdrops, and he hears a conversation of two of the king's servants that are plotting to take his life, it is Mordecai that uses messengers and, makes his, and gets his information back to the queen. The queen then lets the king know what's going on, and Mordecai becomes the hero of the story but he's an unseen character to the rest of the crowd around there. He's just the guy outside the gate, but it was through his wisdom. He makes a wise decision. He understands the consequences. It really, in one sense, wouldn't have mattered to him what happens to the king. The Jews were just like uninvited guests there anyways, but nevertheless, he saw that there was something had to be done, and he had an insider and he used the queen to pass on the information and save the king's life. So this poor man is much like that, probably of less significance, that he's not necessarily sitting by the king's gate. And so here is the strength of wisdom from an insignificant little bit individual, he saves the city, conclusion number one. Contrast is going to be that of the vulnerability of wisdom. You see, what we find is this same guy is not the city hero. There is no mention of a parade. There is no mention that his name is placed on a plaque. He's not brought before the king and, and set on the second horse in the road to receive honor and, and because he saved the city. The point is, the guy is still a nobody. He's back to where he started. And there was this poor wise man, and yet in verse 15, no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Verse 17, a contrast again, the words of the wise are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that rules amongst fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much strength. Now he moves. Wisdom is powerful. Wisdom is great has opportunity, it can move nations, it can save a city, it doesn't have to be somebody that's all that well educated, but then we notice its vulnerability. The poor man's wisdom is despised, his words are forgotten. We find also that the, the loud words are that of fools, so these are the, the protesters of that day, the, uh, the banner wavers, 
uh, and nowadays it would be those on the social media, those that are, are making the most noise. It seems as though uh, they are the ones that, that are heard the most. The words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of fools. So there's the contest, there's the contrast that is there that in much speaking of words, it doesn't necessarily get anywhere, but what it does, it tends to want to silence the words of wisdom. If I could sidebar just for a moment, in that one text, the words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that rules amongst the fools. You see, even in Washington, D.C., in the, while the hearings are taking place, and prior to the votes that did not happen, prior to some of the hearings that are taking place, there were prayer meetings of congressional leaders that would meet in a separate room in the Capitol building. Not just a few, but quite a few. The words of the wise are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that rules amongst fools. You see, the power of wisdom is not in the volume, but it's in the heart. It's in that quiet moment. And so while our, our leaders are not throwing in the towel, there are some that are taking the opportunity of the quietness and the solitude and being in a, in a private place as a group, and there are the, the capital uh, chaplains that are there leading the prayer meetings as they did back in the days when our government was first formed. Men of character, men of biblical knowledge, men that understood the authority of the scriptures, whether they were Christians or not, nevertheless, they introduced the whole form of government which we have today, over 200 years old, why? Because quietness over the volume and the noise of fools. And so there is hope of what has taken place. So we leave the sidebar and we come up to the text of where we're at right now. So the first thing we notice that the strength of wisdom, we then move to the vulnerability of wisdom and that is that it's, uh, it is vulnerable, it can be uh, undermined. How does that take place? Because when we look at verse 18, we read this wisdom is better than weapons of war but one sinner destroys much good. So now all of a sudden, it's like he pulls the, the, the legs out from underneath the table and the house of cards, the table collapses. Why? Because one bungler, the word sinner there can be translated to a bungler, a goof, destroys much good. So here's this wise man, saves a city, there's victory, he's forgotten, but nevertheless, he, Solomon highlights how much better and stronger wisdom is than all of a sudden, because of the indiscretion of one individual somewhere in the history of that government, that one individual, one sinner, one bungler, destroys much good. So the whole thing collapses and it falls apart. It's the, the contrast that he's trying to make here, the one with the many, the little and the much. As we move on to chapter 10 and verse 1, the, the dead flies. Here's the little that send forth a stinking savor of the apothecary, of the much. The little insignificant insect that, that destroys the sweet smell. A little folly. That little folly is it, to him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. He has a great reputation, but a little folly brings it down. You move on, the wise man's heart is at his right hand. That is the position of power and strength and, uh, and uh, righteousness, but, his fool, but a fool's heart is at his left. Yea, also when he that is a fool walks by the way, his wisdom fails him and says to everyone that he is a fool. We have an expression that say, you can see an idiot, you can see a fool coming to you a mile away. In other words, their character, their lack of understanding, their folly, their foolishness is, is, is so much part of their life that it's very strength. It's, it can be observable. And so when we, he gets through this passage of the, the strength of wisdom, the, the vulnerability of wisdom, up through where we are at in chapter 10 and, and verse 3, he then once again is going to reiterate the, the strength of wisdom. It seems like all has failed, 
But Solomon in his writing is directing us now, and the emphasis here is the discretionary acts of individuals at some point in time can take great monumental tasks and make them almost unheard of. Why? Because of carelessness. And at a point in time when they were not paying attention, they had a very narrow view of life, they were not looking into the future at all, it was all what mattered right now. And so that little event would destroy a great reputation. But is there, are we without hope? Solomon progresses, he, he takes us to verse 4. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place. For yielding pacifies great offenses. Now you've got to stop and think for a moment. Where is the continuity of all of this? We've went from a city and a little man in a war. The city wins the battle. And then we're taken and we have a comparison of how wisdom's voice is quiet. And the noise of fools makes a lot of noise. Wisdom is strong, but indiscretion can destroy it. And then we have the picture of the, of the fool that walks along and and his, his character and his, and his antics are clearly observed. And then suddenly in verse 4, we are taken to the, the, the uh, Capitol building. And here is the king. And we are in the presence of the king. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee. So that's the situation. Here are the instructions. Leave not thy place. Why? Here is the wisdom. For yielding pacifies great offenses. That's kind of an odd situation, but you have to remember, what is the theme? The theme is the strength of wisdom, its vulnerability due to indiscretionary actions, folly, carelessness, but yet wisdom still has a place. Wisdom still maintains strength, and it can be retrieved. He doesn't want us to give up on the idea that well, we're all going to have, make foolish decisions. And that suddenly, if that's the case of wisdom, it's not that strong after all. What Solomon is presenting to us is the necessity in the valley of maintaining good thoughts, righteous way of thinking and living, biblical wisdom, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he brings that down in just one verse in verse 4. And he does that by saying, for yielding, don't leave. When the ruler starts screaming and shouting and ranting and raving, do not leave thy place, for yielding pacifies great offenses. So in other words, there's wisdom to hold your ground with an angry king. Yeah, I don't know about that. What if the king pulls the sword out and calls one of his men over there and says, take him out. We don't need this guy. He's really not listening to me. Is there a situation in the Bible that reiterates that point? You don't have to necessarily turn there, but if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 25... And here we have the, the story where David, as a, as a mercenary, as, a, rene, as a, a fugitive and a renegade, but he also starts out up with his own little army, and he is kind of like the protector of the people. And as he goes about, he comes to a, a, a farmer, a man by the name of Nabal. And this guy, um, the, David's men, would go in and offered him a hedge of protection against the marauders and the intruders and wildlife in his uh, farming industry of sheep. And so David uh, says, you know, we could use some food and water, and comes up to him, and the man's name is, means he was a fool. And so when the information comes back that this guy says, ah, oh, it's probably some renegade king's son, wants to start up his own little kingdom, and you think I'm going to do anything, and his servant said, listen, this man's army has helped us all these years. I don't care. Well, when that word gets back to David, and this is the highlight of the story, David, at that point in time, sets forth a judgment. He tells his men to get armed. We're going to go back in there, and we are going to wipe out everybody in there. Every male is going to be destroyed. There will be no more Nabal or his men. His wife comes and pleads with David. And when you listen to her words, she's approaching the angry ruler, David. And his temper is hot. And as she comes in, she then uses standing her ground. And she comes before him and she pleads on behalf of the ignorance and the foolishness of her husband. And she pleads common sense. 
that if he were to do this, this would ruin his reputation. So the point of it is that even though the king would rise up, as we are told in verse 4, and the spirit of the ruler rise up against the way, do not leave your place. She didn't. Abigail did not leave her place. Rather, she stood and she presented wisdom to David. And in the presentation of that wisdom to David, we find that God took care of the, the man himself, and David and eventually would acquire a wife, and a war, a civil war within that area was prevented, and a lot of lives were saved. Why? Because this lady, with the rising up of the spirit of the ruler, she stood her place, she did not leave her place, and the end result was wisdom was given to the king, and he honored it. So Solomon, as he moves along from the, the strength of wisdom, it's vulnerable due to foolish acts of folly in our younger days. And then he moves and he reiterates the fact that wisdom is still stronger than the weapons of war. He illustrates it with the, the situation of the ruler that I've illustrated to you with the situation of Abigail in the presence of David. And it gives to him good counsel and direction so that no lives were taken in the process. So let's make the application of, of this truth. We've so far been just been sort of like telling stories. And we've been in politics, and, and we've been in the battlefield, and we've been in the presence of a king, and we've, we've seen uh, all the things that are important for us to know and the delicate balance that is there. But I want to make an application of the truth. Once again, we'll take you back to the Kavanaugh hearings. The actions that took place, true or false, I think some of the evidence lies in the book, his own book that he wrote, and it, that's, that's public information. But the point is, the indiscretion, the carelessness that took place then with no thought of what it's going to be like 15, 20, 30 years down the road. And so here we are, and we have to be able to think the same way. The only difference is this. We've got to think in terms of where do we get this kind of wisdom? Where do we get the kind of wisdom that is going to give us foresight? The kind of wisdom and understanding that will issue and that give answers to the challenges and the temptations and the issues of life that we face today. Where do we find that? And is there, any, is there anything that is, that is compared to it? Well, in Colossians chapter 2, if you'll turn there in your Bibles, Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the scriptures give us a clear statement on that very question, on the, the who and where we are going to find the kind of wisdom that meets the demands, the philosophical challenges, the moral challenges, the ethical challenges of the day. And that is found in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 2 of Colossians that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all the riches of the full assurance and understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, of the Father, and of Christ. The last word, that's all I'm interested in right now, is the word Christ. The next verse, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So one person... A singular individual holds in his possession all of the treasury of wisdom. Everything that has to do with all manner of situations in life are found in Jesus Christ. You compare that to the wisdom that everybody else and anything else will offer to you, and you will find it will have 100,000 different authors. It will have a history of of uh, testing and failure, and some worked out, some did not. It will have a reputation that only fits a particular cultural group or particular need. It cannot cross over denominational lines, ethical lines, moral lines. It can't do anything. The wisdom of the world is vast, it's various, and it's unpredictable, and you're never sure if it's going to work. But you come to Jesus Christ, and here you find the treasury of wisdom. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Why is it hidden? Because it's only available to those that will submit themselves 
to the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It's hidden, it's, it's hidden to those who are, and, and saved for those who will believe in and ex receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now the treasury doors are open. But to the rest of the world that rejects Jesus Christ, they are without access to that treasury, that wealth of information. The very information that people yearn for and cry out for. How are we going to solve this problem? What are we going to do with this situation? Things get very convoluted nowadays. But only Christ has a treasury that when you open up that lid, you find that in there or everything that is needed and necessary and given unto us, all the things that pertain unto life and the godliness. That is the treasury that is found in Jesus Christ, in whom are hid these treasuries. And what is it? Of wisdom and knowledge. I think David had access to some of that. David had access to that because he listened to the poor, wise woman. You got to remember back in that day that uh, the... The, the, the wife of the servant. She was a piece of property. She wasn't necessarily an, an affectionate lover as the way that we, they, we bring marriages and lives together today. And, and so for, for her, she would have equivalent to that little small quiet voice in the city. And through her wisdom, the, the entire farming industry and all of its employees were rescued. And David listened to that still, small voice of that woman that came and pleaded her case and, and the case of the men that were Nabal's servants. David listened to that. So David understood that wisdom comes from God. And he would later on say that while man was cursing him, he'd say, let the man curse. He's sent from God. He had a biblical worldview of situations that would impact his life. How do you think that way? Because he had access to the treasury of wisdom and knowledge, and he applied it to his situation, and he applied it to his life. So how do you get that? First thing is there to know him. You have to know him, that we might know him, the power of his resurrection. When we know him, he will, he will guard our hearts as we read in. If we, as we go down to verse 6, or excuse me, in verse 4, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. So he, that knowledge of Christ, having that treasury, to be able to draw from it those things that are going to make a difference in our life, come from knowing Jesus Christ, and it protects us, it guards us from the craftiness of foolish wisdom. Secondly, we have this treasury and we're able to enter into it, we walk and we grow in that wisdom. Look at verse 7. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding with thanksgiving. So there's this growing process found in him, all the treasury of wisdom and knowledge, that will guard us from false believers, false philosophy. We grow in that wisdom, and then we will also find ourselves in verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you, or you become captive through the philosophy and empty deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And so there is a cultural wisdom that is out there that professes to have an answer to some of the dilemmas that we face. The answers are false. It is not the right answer. It will not bring about the kind of results that are absolute and true and that are good. It may bring some temporary healing, some temporary repair, but ultimately there's still something left further on the down that cultural wisdom cannot see or predict. But the wisdom that comes from Jesus Christ takes into consideration not only the moment, not only the situation as it is right now, but it looks down the hallways of time into the future, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. And it gives men the ability to think outside of the proverbial box. Takes them out of a locked in time box and allows them to make decisions that they do not realize are going to impact the future. That is why we still have the kind of government we have that is over 200 years old. Because men followed the wisdom of the scriptures 
not necessarily putting a clock to it, but they made decisions that were based on the absolute truth of the word of God, is how government should operate, the three divisions of government. And we find that because of that kind of understanding, the application of the treasury chest of Jesus Christ, our government still stands. And it has its problems, but it still stands. Secondly, not only when we talk about application of the truth, it's to know Jesus Christ, but to guard our hearts with all wisdom. I want to make a point out of this that I think is very relevant for the times in which we live and the times in which I grew up. It has never changed. I don't know that it will ever will change. And that is this, to listen to the counsel of three groups. Listen to the counsel of your parents. Listen to the counsel of the scriptures. Listen to the counsel of the elders. Three primary sources of wise direction that you cannot dismiss. The wisdom of parents, the wisdom of scriptures, the wisdom of those that are older than who we are. I make that application because if we go back to the, our text in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, we go back to the little old guy on the street. And if we were walking about in the, in the streets of that city in that point in time, we're just a small village. We might be a little bit bigger than that, and our city walls are not very high. And here's, here's this guy that we say good morning to him. We don't even know his name. And he might say something to you. He's like, you know what you ought to do in a situation like that, son, is uh, you need to rethink what you're doing. Let me give you some direction. Let me give you some advice. And probably the, the, uh, the way that that would have been handled is, who are you? You don't have a nine name. You haven't written a book. You don't have a DR in front of your name or an MD or an MDiv. Or, or there's nothing. We don't even know your name. And so he's treated as insignificant. And the point of that, that little illustration is, a, is, is the fact that this no-name individual was treated with disrespect and he was forgotten. But yet his wisdom was profound. His wisdom saved death and lives in the city from destruction, from a major, huge army. I would just like to suggest to you that sometimes that is the way that, that young people look at their parents. What do they know? You know, they, they're not in our times. They don't have the same uh, challenges that we face right now. Let me, let me remind you something, young people. The challenges are all the same. It's kind of like that TV series, uh, the names have been changed to protect the innocent, but the story you're about to see is true. In other words, those temptations, those challenges that you face now are the same thing that I faced, my parents faced. The only thing that's changed are the faces and the time, the year, and the dates. The consistency is all there. And so therefore, it's may, maybe we don't seem to know what we're talking about, but yet the little old wise man on the street corner didn't know what he was talking about either. But yet when the city listened to him, it saved the city. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And one of the ways in which we guard our heart with all diligence is that we, we seek out and we find wisdom that is true, wisdom from experience, wisdom from knowledge of the scripture, wisdom that is directed by the words of God and the Holy Spirit. Pay attention to parents, pay attention to the scriptures. Do not despise the word of God. It's not old fashioned, it's not dead, it's alive and it's living. Do not despise or take lightly the counsel of the older generation. They, they have seen much. And even though they may not know what it is to operate an iPad, they know what it is to face a temptation. They may not know how to navigate the world wide web and find out all the information that you can find with the, with the movement and a swipe of a finger, but they will tell you how to save your soul, how to save your life, how to prevent you from falling into extreme danger, indiscretionary acts that will have consequences later on in life. You listen to those. That's how you guard your heart with all diligence. And so from that, our poor man in the city saves the city. He does it by virtue of wisdom. Where do we get wisdom? 
leaving Solomon's preaching and looking to that of Jesus Christ, we find it in Christ alone. In him are hid the treasuries of wisdom and knowledge through Jesus Christ. How do I know him? Do you admit sinfulness? Admit your emptiness? Admit the fact that you're, you're already judged, condemned on your way to hell, but God offers pardon, and that pardon comes through the death of his son. He paid the price. Sin has to be paid for. There is a penalty. It's like with Nicolas Cage and the FBI agent. Somebody's got to go to jail in the, in the uh, National Treasure series. Somebody's got to go to jail. Somebody's got to pay the penalty of sin. Somebody has to suffer the consequences. And in this case, it doesn't have to be you. Jesus Christ did it for you. So that somebody come in, took your place. Will you believe that? Will you trust him that he died for your sin? Once you do that, now you are in the in him who has hidden, once before hid, but now is opened up the treasuries of wisdom and knowledge. Meanwhile, if you refuse to accept that, you're back with the city, despising the wisdom, making much noise, careless folly that will undermine anything that once stood and making poor decisions. So true wisdom is found in Jesus Christ and him alone. Father, I pray that by the end of this day, we will have a, a great affection and a love for the wisdom of God, a love for our Savior. That you would instruct us in the error of our way and our thinking at times, that uh, just careless words and, and thoughtless actions living just for the moment and not taking into consideration the, the many years that will follow, your plans for us and how they can be uh, ruined. I ask, Lord, that in, from myself on down, every individual here in their situation in life, they would seek out the hidden treasuries of the wisdom and knowledge of Jesus Christ to know him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.